degeneracy, the two kinds of desire, and my biggest criticism of the Christian worldview. Brothers and sisters, we start today's readings with the epistle, where Paul tells us about the glory and the riches of Christ. And then he prays for us. He prays for us that we will, found, we will find a firmly rooted charity and that, we, and that Christ will dwell in our hearts and that we may be strengthened to comprehend the length and height and breadth and depth of Christ's love which surpasses all knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. He asks us this so that we may be with given knowledge, we may have empowerment, and we may have enlovement. I've spoken before about power, love, and vision, and the relationship between all three. How love without power makes you resentful and bitter and loveless. Power without love becomes nothing but blind ambition. Love is a limiting principle on power, and how knowledge, or vision, directs both love and power to its proper end. I've spoken of this, and here, Paul speaks of it too, in different words, but in greater detail. I want you to put that in the back of your minds as we continue on this talk, because it will come up again later, and it will be like the background against which everything is hemmed, everything is sewn, everything is glued and bonded. We move to the Gospel. Now, the first thing one might notice is that there are two different stories here. Jesus cures a man with dropsy in the context of explaining to the Pharisees that it is lawful to heal or to help people on Shabbos. But then... He lectures the Pharisees and the people that are at this house about the seat that they choose to take at table. It's like two different stories here. What is the connection for crying out loud? Somebody please tell me. To a modern person, it makes a lot less sense. To an ancient person, to the people for whom the Gospel of Luke was actually written, and Luke was writing as a physician, and so this gives a little bit of extra oomph here, for the people for whom the gospel was written, it made perfect sense. Because dropsy, known in Greek and Latin as idrops, or wateriness, in modern, me in modern medicine, the term is usually edema. It refers to an excess buildup of fluid in some or other part of the body. In ancient times, it was believed to be an abundance of water. And the observation was made, this was, you'll see this in Horace, you'll see it in Ovid, you'll see it in Seneca, and you'll see it alluded to here in the Gospel. In ancient times, and all the way up until 1950, it was believed that dropsy was caused by an excess of water, and that the more a person, a person with, with dropsy or edema drinks, the thirstier they become. And so dropsy became a, a symbol of greed or a symbol of degeneracy. In a homily for today, St. Ambrose says that the man with dropsy had an overflowing, of, of, an, a carnal overflowing that drowned out. It drowned out the intellect. It drowned out the fire of the spirit. It drowned out the life of the soul. This is what St. Ambrose tells us. If, you can go to the Venomo feature and find that in the Matins reading for today, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. So, what we have here, and in this, all the way to the, I believe, 17th century, when Leonard Goffin writes in his explanation of the Epistles and Gospels, that the man with dropsy is a symbol of degeneracy, or of moral license, I forget his exact wording, because the more, this, the more a person with edema or dropsy drinks, the thirstier they become. This connection was very clear in medical science all the way up until 1950, when Ferdinand, Ferdinand Shem discovered 
that it was not an overwatering that was the problem, but an overbrining. This is when edema became connected with sodium restricted diets. Um, May 15th, 1950, Time Magazine has an article about this, which I will link in the description. If I forget to do that, please remind me. So that's your background. Greed or degeneracy, of which the, man, the dropsical man is considered a symbol. This brings us to the people that were taking the best seats at the table. Now, we all know this phenomenon. We all know this phenomenon because we all went to high school. In high school, everybody, at lunchtime, everybody would rush for the best seats. Like, not even high school, junior high, elementary school. Everybody would rush for the best seats. And if you were left out, you were left out. So we know this from experience. In church, up until I think like the, the 19th century, the rich people bought the best seats through what was called pew rents. There were denominations who opposed us. I believe the Methodists may have been one of them. I don't remember exactly. But they opposed us. That they could bu literally buy the best pews, and pew renting, that was actually how churches, fit, how churches were funded back then, as opposed to voluntary donations like churches are funded now. But again, the more important places. It's no different than who can afford the best place at a concert venue. But here, it's a matter of arrogance. People will take the best place at the table. This is what Jesus noticed. They'll take the best place at the table. And Jesus is like, no, this isn't right. This is arrogance on your part. This is pride on your part. And commentary is like covetousness. And he explains it in terms of what we modern people might call enlightened self-interest. If you, Because if you're trying to take the more important spot at the table, you want to look good in front of everybody. That's generally what we see. People like to look good in front of other people. As Eliphaz Levy once said, for the majority of people, the predominant fault is egotism. And this plays right into it. We want to look good. We want to look awesome. We want people to like us. We want people to look up to us. We want people to respect us. Come on. You know the drill. We've all been through this. We're human. With that in mind, Jesus told them, you might think you look good when you take that seat next to the head of the table or wherever they were sitting. But what if the person who invited you says, hey, this seat's reserved for somebody else. You get, kicked to the, you get kicked all the way to the bottom, everybody sees us, and then how do you look? You don't look respectable, you look dumb. You just plain look dumb. So, rather than arrogating your, to yourself the highest part of the table, or the most important part of the table or of the sitting, sitting area, take the bottom. Go to the bottom. You go to the bottom, and then let somebody come and invite you. Hey, sit up higher. Now, I find it interesting that Jesus was talk, is talking in, with the parable of a wedding feast here, well, with the metaphor of a wedding feast. Yeah, metaphor is a better word. I find it fascinating because when I was, when I was officiating weddings, there were weddings that I did for, there were weddings that I did where I didn't even expect to be there at the reception. Okay. When you're the officiant, receptions don't always work out that well for you, even when you're friends with the bride and groom. They don't always work out well for you because they tend to be turned in on themselves. Okay, it's like the party, it turns very inward. Anybody who's a stranger to the group or that is just not like super in with the group, you tend to get ignored. Yet there are weddings I've done for people I barely knew where I was invited where I was invited to sit at, at the bridal couple's table. Then there were weddings I did for close friends where, at the reception, I ended up just sitting at the bar. But at the same time, I sat at the bar, people would come up to me, people would talk to me. It was actually a wonderful time that was had by all anyway. So it worked out regardless. 
And so I find it interesting that Jesus uses the metaphor of a wedding feast because I have experienced this in my real life. So what does this say about the two types of desire? Okay, we have the analogy for degeneracy. That's going to play into this too. Okay, the two types of desire. We already know my discussion of the second noble truth in Buddhism. In English is commonly said, the cause of suffering is desire. Whereas, what Buddha actually said was the cause of suffering is thirst. The original word in Pali is tanha, which refers to thirst or craving. And I've often likened that to thirsty men sliding into your DMs. The reason that these men do not have a girlfriend is the fact that they're thirsty. But they're thirsty because they do not have a girlfriend. It's a vicious cycle. This plays into the two types of desire as I perceive it. One we may call thirst, and is exactly what we just talked about. The other I have very recently taken to calling hunger. And the difference between thirst and hunger is that thirst is self-sabotaging. Hunger has the potential to be empowering. Why is thirst self-sabotaging? Because thirst comes from a position of ignorance. To use the idea of the thirsty man, I don't have a girlfriend. I can't get a girlfriend because all these women are stuck up, because they're all looking out for Chad or something like that, or because they have unrealistic expectations. We have, I want you to notice something. The thirsty person is saying, I don't have a girlfriend because it is their fault. I want you to notice that. It's thirst blames other people. Thirst comes from a place of ignorance. It's not, I don't have a girlfriend because I don't know how to talk to women. It's, I'm coming from a place of ignorance. It's not, I'm broke because I don't know how to manage my finances. It's, I'm broke because the government or rich people or employers or my next door neighbor is screwing me over. See the blame. It's blame. So it comes from a place of blame. And then it comes from a place of envy. Blame leads to envy. I blame women for the reason I don't have a girlfriend, therefore I am envious of women, and I am envious of those men who do have girlfriends. Do you see the pattern? And then it leads to a vicious cycle, because you are not addressing the cause of the thirst, which is your own ignorance. Thirst can also be connected with anxiety. When we bring this to a spiritual level, the reason a lot of people's magic does not work, and this is, since we're talking about stop clocks, this is one thing where Crowley was right when he talked about lust for result, though the word anxiety for result, and I, I thank Rocky Guys for that term, the word anxiety actually works better. Anxiety because I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know how to do this. Or I am so desperate. I am so needy. I am so thirsty. Thirst leads to anxiety for result, and thirst sabotages manifestation. So this type of desire, thirst, is very much the cause of suffering. Blame, envy, anxiety, desperation. Because you're not addressing the problem inside yourself. Now let's move on to hunger. Hunger is empowering and dangerous. Hunger, let's use the example of the man who does not have a girlfriend. I know I use that a lot in these talks, but that's because it's very convenient, it's very relatable. Everybody understands what it's like to be lonely and not have somebody. I do apologize to the ladies for the fact that I tend to emphasize a male point of view in this, but that's just all I have. I'm not a woman. I've never been a woman, to the best of my knowledge. I only partially understand how women think, so I'm not able to give a solid analogy there. Okay, so hunger. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't have a girlfriend because I lack the social skills. I don't have a girlfriend because I've... because. I don't go anywhere. I stay at home all the time on my computer. 
I don't have a girlfriend because I have not developed qualities of myself that women find attractive. Notice the difference. In thirst, the blame is on other people. In hunger, the blame, there is no blame at all. It, it's appraisal of myself. I am saying any issue is with me. These are things that I have not developed. These are things I have not developed. These are things that I have not done. And so hunger says, I am going to gather the knowledge to talk to women. I am going to force myself to learn how to talk to people in general. I am going to find places to go where I may meet somebody. And yes, you notice I talk about meeting people in real life. I don't talk about on online, online software or apps or whatever. Because my entire experience was back in the days where you went out in person on Friday or Saturday night. You went out to meet somebody. You didn't do this internet stuff. Which, quite honestly, I'm not interested in and I admit I don't understand. With that in mind, I will develop my skill set. That is what hunger, what hunger generates. You don't blame... You simply make an appraisal of yourself, a brutally honest appraisal of yourself, and then you ask, what do I do to fix this? These are my shortcomings. What do I do to fix them? And hunger becomes a desire. It, all, it can become an all-consuming desire. This is where it is good and where it is bad. It is empowering because it leads you to fix your shortcomings. In spiritual work, it starts with the premise of, I know this is going to happen. If this manifestation does not happen, then I could troubleshoot it and make it happen. That's hunger. I am, it's not, I'm craving you, I'm, I'm craving you, but I can't get you. It is, I'm going to eat you, one way or another. That's where hunger is empowering, but it's also dangerous without a limiting principle. It is very dangerous because hunger, as it grows and grows and grows, and the more you attain, the more hungry you become. As it grows and grows and grows, without a limiting principle, it becomes all-consuming. And it does not just consume you. It consumes others. It can hurt others. It can steamroll over others. It, it can lead other people to their deaths if you are not careful with it, if you do not have self-discipline and self-control. And this is where the symbol of the man with the dropsy comes into place. Ancient medicine said that the more this person drinks, the more this person becomes thirsty. Well, in thirst, as a form of desire, you either don't get to drink at all, you get to drink very little, or you drink something substandard. Like you want clear water and, you, and, and, you're, and you're drinking something that's almost mud. That makes you thirsty for clear water. With hunger, you have to have a limiting principle to control it. And this is where the epistle comes in. This is where love is a limiting principle to power. And knowledge is the principle that directs it. So when St. Paul prays that we find knowledge and we have love and we have empowerment, when he prays for this, this is a prayer that we should say for ourselves too. We should meditate on today's epistle. Not just today, not just on the 16th Sunday of Pente after Pentecost. Not just on the weekdays following. But we should make that triad of power, love, and vision. We should make that triad a daily meditation throughout our lives. The ability to do things, the ability to keep ourselves from doing things that are harmful, and the knowledge to direct it, and the perception to direct it for positive, beneficial ends. Yet, everything we just talked about today, it leads me to my my one criticism 
and perhaps my biggest criticism of the Christian worldview. I want you to notice, this is not a criticism of Christianity. It is not a criticism of Christian theology. It is not a criticism of the Christian religion. It is a criticism of the commonly held Christian worldview that it is encouraged, but it is encouraged among the populace, it is encouraged in the churches, it is encouraged within families. That worldview, as we talked about humility, we talked about Jesus saying, don't take the higher place, take the lower place and wait for the person who invited you to invite you to a higher seat. That plays into this aspect of the Christian worldview that is, know your place and do not try to rise above it. I have a massive problem with that. I have a massive problem with that. And we hear this in... Now, we, we definitely hear this inside Protestantism. We hear it within Catholicism, too. It's usually in the case of... It's usually in the case of, if you question, if you question a teaching, if you question something the priest says... A common retort will be, oh, so you think you know better than Jesus, his mother, the apostles, the Bible, and every doctor of the church? Did you see that? The question of the individual is subsumed under the consent of the collective. So the individual, therefore, is told, you have no right to question. Know your place and don't try to rise above it. Whenever something bad happens, we're told, oh, just offer it up. Just off, offer it up to him. United with, unite your sufferings with the cross. Sometimes that's valid. We should unite our sufferings with the suffering of Jesus on the cross. Yes. But that does not mean we should, in, we should accept suffering for the sake of suffering. It does not mean we should not try to mitigate our suffering. It does not mean we should not try to overcome what is causing our suffering so that we may be free of it. Do you see where I'm going here? The whole idea of know your place. And I'm not the only person to say it. We're speaking about stop clocks. Karl Marx was a stop clock. But he was only right once a day. And the one thing he was right about is the full context of religion as the opiate of the people. What he actually meant by that was that religion distracts people from distracts people from seeing their true condition. It teaches them to know their place and not try to rise above it. Now again, every his his I, I see him as an unoriginal hack. He ripped off Hegel, he ripped off the he ripped off the what were the other things? He ripped off Rousseau, he ripped off Hegel, and he ripped off the dominant notions of materialism that were present at the time. This is why he was condemned by literally every pope from 1849 up to 2005. Except for John Paul I, who was only in office for 30 days, so he didn't get a chance. Okay. But... Since we're talking about quotes that are taken out of context, religion is the open of the people, that's actually right because people are distracted and knowing their place and not trying to rise above it. We can turn to another, another quote that's taken out of context. Nietzsche, God is dead. How many times have we heard people, usually neo-pagans or atheists, quote Nietzsche as saying God is dead? The problem is, that's only half the quote. It's in context of the parable of the madman where a madman is running around shouting that God is dead. People don't like hearing this. But the quote is, God is dead and we have killed him. And he's not talking about there being a lack of a deity. What he's talking about is there, what he's talking about is humanity has removed God from their consciousness. What will we do to replace him? What will we do to replace religion? That's what Nietzsche is talking about. And the idea of know your place but do not rise above it also plays into his concept of slave morality, which is what is taught from the pews. 
Know your place. Don't rise above it. Embrace suffering for the sake of suffering. Empathy to the point of making yourself a doormat. And that one is something that the enemies of Christianity have very successfully latched upon in order to neuter a once Christian society. So what we are seeing here is a complete, a complete course of what is wrong. Something that should be jettisoned from the Christian worldview. Now, understand your place. Yes. Know your place in the sense of understanding it. Yes. Understand where you are. Make a realistic appraisal of where you can be and strive to be there. Whether it is success in business, job promotion, success in relationships. Just because you are single and cannot get a girlfriend does not mean that God has called you to be an incel. That's not a calling. It could be situational. You may live in an isolated area where you just can't meet anybody. And I do firmly believe that the best way to meet people is in real life rather than over the internet. I very firmly believe that. Where was I? That's where I was. Know your place tells you if you can't get a girlfriend, God has called you to celibacy. Know your place says if you can't get ahead financially, God has called you to poverty. No. God has called nobody to celibacy or marriage. God has called nobody to poverty or wealth. God has called nobody to any of these conditions. In fact, both St. Ignatius of Loyola and Eliphas Levy say, we should form in ourselves an attitude of indifference, of detachment to these various things. When I was praying the rosary one day, and I was meditating on the third joyful mystery, the nativity, I heard a woman's voice saying, indifference is power. So we should cultivate an attitude of detachment, not a depraved indifference. Just like there are two types of desire, there are two types of indifference. There must be a limiting principle. And that limiting principle is empathy. There is a need for empathy. This is where love comes in. Power, love, and vision. Remember that triad. But as we progress, we should force ourselves never to lose sight of that. But our empathy should never be so much that we make ourselves a doormat for anybody who wants to run, to run roughshod over us. That is the teaching that has hurt so many churches, that has cut so many believers, and that has hurt our society as a whole. Don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out is a, is a parallel to this. So as we progress in our spiritual life, whether we find ourselves more in tune with the active life, with the contemplative life, with the mixed life, as we do our spiritual work to manifest good things in our lives, let us approach not with an attitude of pride or of thirst or of anxiety or of excessive attachment. Let us approach it with an attitude of hunger that is bounded in by love and directed by knowledge and vision. And let us approach this with a healthy detachment. Just as there is unhealthy attachment, there is also unhealthy detachment. Unhealthy attachment makes you a stalker. Unhealthy detachment makes you a psychopath. Please keep that in mind. So with a healthy level of detachment, we move forward. And we will find ourselves growing in everything that we want to grow in. Because that is the nature of the universe. That is the nature of the world around us. And that is the nature of human interaction with one another. With that note, I leave you.
with that note, I would ask you to think about this throughout the week, the various things we've talked about. And may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.